give a warm welcome to uh, Brian Eno, Eve Oak, and Laurie Anderson. We've all worked together before, but we've never worked, the three of us, together before. I've worked with Eve, Eve has worked with Laurie, and I've worked with Laurie in the past. So this is the first time that the three of us has worked together, but it's not like working with, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody you don't know at all. <laughs> Laurie, what did you bring uh, with you for the project? I brought a lot of things, a lot of filters and instruments and violins and I couldn't I didn't have room for my ukulele but neither of one of you seemed that sad about that I'm very happy that the yeah <laughs> the ukulele was too fragile to fit into her <clears throat> luggage I I believe that certain instruments should be discouraged by heavy taxation do you feel that way about the hurdy-gurdy yeah banjo ukulele and flute <laughs> goodbye what about her hurdy-gurdy Hurdy gurdy, I like that. Do you? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's a good instrument. Okay. I have it's a arbitrary. soft spot for banjo. I mean, I grew up in the really? deep south, so. It's something you'll have to deal with, Eeb. <laughs> Eno, uh, what did you bring to the studio? Um, I brought. I brought a lot of. I bought seventy pieces of music. But they're not finished pieces of music. They're sort of provocations, if you like. They're things that are the start of something. And, you know, maybe we'll need the start of something. Um, so some of them are just single sounds. Some of them are double sounds. Some of them are rhythmic. Some of them are atmospheric. Some of them are both rhythmic and atmospheric. And I also bought two little rubber hammers, which I have discovered make everything in the world sound interesting. I, I use them to beat things with. Did you play any of those things today? Yeah. Of the 70s? Mm. Okay. I, I play, I, every percussion thing I did was with those little hammers. <coughs> yeah. They're made of high-grade neoprene. They're made in England. I brought uh, a MIDI controller because I run everything through MIDI mostly. And a lot of a selection of images that I've printed off to read to respond to. And also a collection of pieces like Brian has done, things to sort of provoke and generate the, a movement or a conversation between us. You know, I noticed that you uh, you are very aware of your uh, circumstances you're in at any time. You uh, you seem to. I, I've seen you uh, play with pianos at a restaurant, and I've seen you play with. A yeah, that's what I do. It's the only way I can He's make, a big kid. make money. These you, 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 you seem to have a very uh, you seem to have a very um, uh, meant in the most possible way uh, childlike like uh, curiosity to life. Would that be uh, Would that be wrong? No, that wouldn't be wrong. That's that good. would actually be right. <laughs> <laughs> There's right. nothing in between. <laughs> no, I, um, I suppose that we, we all know that all children are artists in a way, and it takes about 12 years of education to persuade them that they aren't. And, and it usually succeeds. You know, most people are persuaded by the time they leave school that they aren't actually very creative. Whereas everybody knows when you go to school at first, you're very, very creative. Your parents know it, everybody knows it, and it, it really is a major effort of civilization to stamp that out of people. Um, and it, perhaps it doesn't happen so much in Denmark, but in England we do an incredibly good job of it. 
we're famous for, actually. How did you survive that process? Um, disobedience and masturbation were really the two. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you're young, you reach a point in your life where you start to have feelings that you're not supposed to have. Mm. And on the one hand, you have your religion saying, those are bad feelings. And your mind is saying, those are bad feelings. And your mm. body is saying, those are really good feelings. And finally, your body wins. Mine did, anyway. And so that set me off on a different path, really. Laurie, what was your uh, kind of disobedience? How did you uh, gain the awareness that you have? I wasn't disobedient. I, I, no? No, I, I, I was the kid who got there really early to school, like an hour or two early. Uh, to feed the fish and, you know, ingratiate myself with the teacher, you know, <laughs> and, you know, erase the board. And I loved school. I, and I, I loved the, uh, didn't really like the rules, but we didn't have any rules, really. And nobody ever asked us what we wanted to do, so it didn't seem to matter. And also, I didn't have a struggle with the uh, an authority thing that you're talking about. Um, I went to a very, for example, church that was called the Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant Church. The, the Swedish what? Yes, a Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant. Maybe some of you know this. It's basically like a, a, a coffee church. It's always about it's, a, it's about coffee, really, hmm. uh, more than anything else. And you, a lot of religions are based on drugs, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> You just go, and, and every Sunday the, the, the preacher says, you know, you, you really should be nice to each other and, and, and do good things because it's better for you and for them. And we're like, seems good. And then we go down to the fellowship room and you get wired on coffee. <laughs> and the rest of the Sunday is like, <laughs> you know, you're, so it's, you know, that's the, that was the teaching. And, it, it, and I, uh, I, I enjoyed that. It was very, it made a lot of sense to me. There was nothing uh, uh, about what, what you're supposed to do, really. I didn't really? get that. Hmm. I grew up in, in a very conservative place, as you know. And I, it was a very religious environment in the Deep South, in the Bible Belt. And I think that having been given two exorcisms for being queer was something that really woke me up. Exorcisms? <laughs> yeah. Really? What Cast out the gay demon. But I, I ah. found that there were other periods before because I felt that somehow it was almost a kind of a... I remember Allen Ginsberg saying that his queerness was a kind of... He saw it as a, as a spiritual calling. And I very much relate to that. And I feel that because I didn't get born into this world with a you know, examples of really how to be, and I felt very, I think as a child I even questioned whether I was human or m male or female, and I, I was very detached to a large part, and I think when I finally went to college I started to meet people and be befriend people properly, I suppose, and so I, I had a lot of time to make up my own universe and my own world inside my inside my imagination, I suppose. So I, and also another situation where I, um, I healed myself as a teenager from something I was told I might die from instantaneously. And that experience really, really showed me that life just simply isn't what we're told. And I, after that I just, you know, I question everything. Everything's up for question. So. children learn through art you know nobody would stop their child drawing because you know that something important is happening to a mm. child when they draw or when they sing or when they dance so we, we know that children learn through through art um, through play basically and what we don't we don't make the next connection which is that adults 
use art as a way of playing. Um, play, art is adult play, really. And similarly, it's the way we learn things. We learn a certain class of things that we don't learn through the other techniques we have of understanding the world, such as science. They're not the same. That's a different way of learning. Although some artists try to claim that they're the same thing, but they, they clearly aren't the same thing. When you make a piece of art, you deliberately construct a world of some kind, and it can be an obvious world, like a theatre play, or a Charles Dickens world, or a Dostoevsky world, and then you look at what happens within that world. Of course, it, it's only interesting if it in some way resembles the real world, but it isn't the real world. And the point about that is that it's therefore safe, so you, you can engage in it, and you can experience emotions that actually you know won't hurt you because you can shut the book or switch the TV off or leave the gallery, whatever, whatever it is. You, you have control over the emotions, essentially. Are we in the real world now? Are we what? Are we in the real Good world question. now? Good uh, question. Yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah, because I don't mm. think that. I think it's, it's a pretty relative term and, and I, I actually don't think that we're sitting on this stage with microphones. Probably what do you suggest we are doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're creating like a, a false world uh, through words that uh, just like we might in, in the studio and that we're with these stories that we're coming up with about who we supposedly are in our childhood and the interesting theories that we have. We're, we're making these hmm. false worlds. I, would call, I mean, I wouldn't call it false anyway. I wouldn't call it real or false. Hmm. I'd just call it the creation of different realities. I had been hearing for years and years that art was to do with capturing reality in some way. Right. And I knew that wasn't true. I just, that didn't feel right to me. And there was that whole kind of old art criticism thing about art and truth, that the job of artists was to somehow find the truth. And I thought, that's not what I want from art. It's, I want interesting fictions, mm -hmm. you know. Actually, if I want the truth, the closest I'll get to it is in science, not in art. But and science which is constantly proving itself wrong. Mm. No, of course it is. Of course it is. But it's, it's trying to find what is, what's the closest we can get to, to a description of reality that seems to hold up in the face of the evidence. So that would be an ever-changing... It's ever-changing. your relationship to the past? Do you bring the past and, and your experiences into the, the studio? Well, yes. Quite physically, actually. <laughs> quite, <laughs> yes. quite a lot of it. Um, I mean, the, thing, the things I've brought with me are things that I've started in the past. I start a lot of things and I, I don't finish very many. But I, I like to have a lot of starts around so that when something comes up, when mm. some need comes up, I've, I've already started. <laughs> you know, for instance, if somebody asks me to do a f soundtrack for a film, I just think, I always sort of say yes, because I'm sure I've already done it, actually. <laughs> It's just a question of finding it in my archives. <laughs> I love how you, you told me once that you will just put on your iTunes with all your, these starts when you're washing the dishes and you might hear something. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yes, so, so I, I have 4,700 unreleased pieces of music. And so when I'm, when I'm tidying up, I put, I put the archive on shuffle. And, and sometimes something... It's not only my music in the archive, so sometimes something will come up that I don't recognize at all. And I think, God, that's really good. I wonder who did that. And sometimes it's me. <laughs> it's true. It's amazing. 
<laughs> Did you ever want to finish somebody else's work? Yes, sometimes, yeah. yeah. In fact, there's one piece that I have which I really like, and I, don't, I know it isn't by me. Do you know who it's by? No, I have no idea who it's by. It's been in my archive for years. Can you hum it? Well, I don't know what to do with it, because I, I would... In fact, I did work on it, because I thought for a while it might have been mine. What's making it good? I, I think what makes it good is that it's obviously not by me. <laughs> do you know what, what I mean? What it's, else? It's, what else? it's unfamiliar. There's right. something yeah. about it that I wouldn't have done, mm. mm -hmm. which is... I know it's not by me. What is it that you wouldn't have done? Are you saying I should copy this person? No. <laughs> you say, are you no. saying I should make my own version? No. <laughs> but what, what, do you, do you, um, what is it? It's, it's quixotic in a way that I wouldn't be. It has a couple of changes in it that are very surprising. Mm -hmm. hmm. And I just know that I don't do that kind of surprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not my thing. I, yeah. I do some another kind of surprise, but yeah, not that kind. Yeah, you have kind. a lot of surprises. <laughs> They're sort of rather slow, my surprises. Slow surprise. Yeah, slow surprise. <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> it's kind of a, quite a long time afterwards. You think, oh, that was surprising. <laughs> There's got to be another word for that. <laughs> slow surprise. Do Do you ever listen to your old releases of uh, records? Not very much. No. Why not? I don't know. Do you ever listen to your records? You'd like? have to pay me to do that. I'll tell you what happens. As soon as you realize it's you, you then start thinking of how you could do it, it better, better, how you yeah. could change it, how you would do it now if you started out. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to regard your own work as sacred in any way, mm -hmm. um, which is what you often do with other people's work. You know, I would never look at a Velasquez painting and think, oh, I think the hair could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you just take it for, as given that other pieces of work are finished, but your, your own work never really is. What builds your identities musically? Laurie? Mm, probably, um, uh, as a young artist, listening to Phil Glass, probably. Mm. And uh, particularly going to the rehearsals of that music and hearing 12 harpies full out, you know, um, uh, 30 second notes for six hours. Mm -hmm. And we just lay on the, on the studio floor and just, just and flood over you and so. And uh, I just remember a lot of people said, you know, I, I do my best work at Phil's rehearsals. You know, because you just lie there and, and you're, um, it, it was an extreme, uh, kind of meditation, and a lot of a lot of artists at that time were were working in those kind of extremely repetitive forms, and um, and a very long time frame. And I I love that um, that way of um, doing music wasn't necessarily the way I I did it, but I I felt that that's what my ear was tuned to, for sure. And I I wasn't either the Stones or the Beatles at all. I, I didn't really listen to them much at mm. all. What about you? What was your, what were you tuned to? Uh, I started off with doo-wop. Um, and I think doo-wop seemed so alien to me and so exotic because I, I grew up in an obscure part of England near two big, great big American air bases. So we had lots of American GIs and in our little town, there were lots and lots of coffee bars with jukeboxes full of southern doo-wop. It, it was just something you never heard on the radio, so it had this amazing transgressive quality to it. So hearing these voices, I'd never heard voices mm. like that. And it was years before I realized that all those singers were black people. I just didn't know because there were no photographs of them or anything like that. They all had names like the Chantes and the <laughs> yeah. Delrons and so on, you know. Did, had no idea who they were. And there was this very alien music, and it, it, it was really the sensation that I always wanted in music. I wanted strangeness. Mm -hmm. I wanted music that presented me with an alien civilization of some kind. So that was really my first impression then. Um, 
after that, I got into two things simultaneously. One was the Ray Conniff singers, <laughs> who, who were the sort of essence of easy listening, but I just loved the sound of... Really? Yeah, that's, oh, that's where music for airports of, came from. Dweeb, actually. essence of dweeb. <laughs> well, it's interesting. If you, if you don't know any of the cultural baggage that something has, right. you can really appreciate it in a way that right. nobody else does. Them, yeah. I mean, I remember when I first got into Arabic music, I was totally in love with this singer called Samira Taufik. And it was ages before some kindly Arabic person pointed out to me that she was kind of a, uh, regarded as a rather low-grade pop star. In, in fact, she was an actress who did a few records, you know. But to me, she was the greatest singer on earth. Um, <laughs> I just didn't know the negative story about her, you know. Mm. Did it change you? Your no, I still like her. Probably the biggest influence I had was listening to the swamps in the deep south, and uh, I, we lived on this huge farm, and there were pecan acre, pe pecan orchards, and, you know, many acres, and then there was a, a huge swamp behind that, and I used to be so beguiled by it, but the way that it changed not only by season but by weather and by time of day or night and I used to take these little boating trips in this aluminum boat out into I was a completely insane thing to do but I might sneak out of the house and go and take this aluminum boat into the swamps at night and just listen to the, the panorama of sound and I feel like there's three things that really um, are present in my work and that's mystery, seduction and otherworldliness also, some, sometimes you hear something and you think, Christ, I've never heard that before. I've never heard mm -hmm. anything like that before. For example, something that's been happening recently that I find very interesting. Now, because we all work on computers, it's possible to make music that is ruthlessly in time and ruthlessly in tune. So now there are some very interesting bands come out who've really decided not to do that. Um, I heard something the other day, I unfortunately can't remember the name of the band, and it had the worst drummer and the most off-key singer I've ever heard. And it sounded good. I thought, hey, that's original. Because <laughs> now you know that that's a choice. You know, that, that isn't because they couldn't be in time and in tune, it's because they chose not to be. So suddenly something that would have been just incompetence ten years ago, becomes an, an artistic decision now. Really uh, original. Uh, yeah. Really original, yeah. yeah. Suddenly to, be, to sing really off key is, you think, hey, that's an interesting new way of singing. <laughs> Why are they doing that? So, so I think um, things keep changing their value, you know, they keep reappearing in history and they have a different value each time they reappear. Mm -hmm. So you, it sounds, it, it seems like a repetition of something, but in a new context, it isn't a repetition. You know, just like being out of tune now is not a repetition of being out of tune 15 years ago. It's a statement saying, I have decided to be out of tune. I have decided not to fix my tuning up. So it changes value then. Could that be a choice for you in the studio, in the coming days? Out of tune. Yeah. I think or out of we're time. We're kind of exploring those <laughs> ideas we're, already. Yes, we're beyond out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> we transcended out of tune I and think out of time. Some of my favorite moments are whenever we're um, creating, you know, uh, evolving scenarios of noise, actually. Yeah. Yeah. You said something earlier which actually happened two or three times today where. The three of us are doing, all doing something different. <laughs> and, and it hasn't kind of gelled yet. It hasn't kind of hit the groove where all, we're all in it and doing the same thing. In fact, when we're listening back today, I thought those were very interesting, those transition mm -hmm. moments mm -hmm. where everybody's sort of in a different world for a little while. 
Um, and there's, there's a very nice period where you start to recognize each other's world. Oops. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks, Eve. <laughs> Do why know why I did I get it? that one? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not fair. See, there you go. It's a fix. The whole thing is fixed. Ring. Ring. It's rigged. Ring. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> anyway, sorry. That's, that's all I wanted to say, really. How did you feel about those moments, though, where we were all doing something different? There were so many moments like that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. It's been fun. Laurie Anderson, <laughs> it's been fun. Evoke. Ronino. What was going on in these songs? Who was contributing with what? I'm curious. <laughs> we, we didn't have an agenda with each piece. It just started and we just kept playing for as long as it stayed interesting. Sometimes you just get into a world and if you can stay in that world, it's, it's like going on holiday for a while, you know. Mm. You're suddenly in a place and you just don't want to change anything. Um, so well, those were your instructions. We were on oh, holiday. Oh, those are my instructions, sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought some of this would never end. You know, uh, <laughs> just, and I'd never tried to play like this. You know, just play and play and play and just stay with the instrument even though it's not working. I yeah. never tried to do that. And it was really fascinating because sometimes it did start to work mm. after a while and it was fascinating to me to, it was a really wonderful week for me i learned so much about sort of sticking with something and trying to push it push it push it push it many times in my own things i would just stop and go that's a boring idea and i would just stop but we pushed and and uh, really because brian said just stay with it until well until what Something happens. Something happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think we all came also with our own, some, our own projects and ideas that we wanted to somehow contribute. And then whenever we finally got into the studio, that all sort of went out the window and we just allowed ourselves to just react in the moment with each other. And I think that was really beautiful to see that happen. And I do think that we each brought sort of different things, but it sort of changed around. Like sometimes I would work with Melody, and then Laurie would work with the beat, or Brian would bring a beat. It would really shift around. Do you have uh, fixed roles, or do they shift? And I think it was pretty non-hierarchical. Though we did, uh, Brian was no. More Brian's the boss. Brian is the Come boss. On. <laughs> He's I, the I boss. I think for that, sure. I think that Brian was true. the boss more when it came to <laughs> the editing process. One, two, three, sure. four. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, you're uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not the boss. <laughs> And don't say that I am, all right? I won't. I won't. I, I think promise, we both really I promise, trust. I won't. We both Zip. really trust Brian. So it was I, pretty I, egalitarian, really. You know, we we were just straight lines a lot. 
this. So we had a, we tried different rules. So we kept trying different kinds of rules to see what happened. And one of them was, you start a piece this time. Mm -hmm. And then 15 seconds later, I started, or, and then he starts. Yeah. Within so, like, within the frame of one piece. Hmm. And then we would kind of swap that around sometimes. And but, but we were improvising all the time and, um, you know, improvisations are like relationships. A lot of the time they're just shit. <laughs> and sometimes they're magnificent. And so you just have to sit through the shit and wait until the magnificent bit comes along. The, the nice thing for me is having Laurie playing this very acoustic instrument, the violin. I'm, I mean, I, I do improvise with other people sometimes, but they're generally electronic type people. But the violin introduces a whole sort of physicality and fragility to, to the process, which mm. is foreign to this kind of music, actually. And her voice, of course. We did some experiments where we only used acoustic instruments, like piano and drums and... Rubber bands. Rubber bands, featured quite heavily, and um, uh, paper, and different... Paper? Voice bits. I heard you turning pages. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, <Sounds> desperate. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then we'd switch over, suddenly switched over to the electronics. I mean, to be honest with, you, honest with you, I think we spend most of our time in the electronic world. How is it that in the early 21st century, we've all somehow convinced ourselves to make music on what are effectively typewriters? It's, it's a ludicrous situation. Yeah. It really is. These things were not designed for making music. <laughs> that is so pathetic sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is clearly an intermediate stage of culture. We demand a show. We're going to laugh at these, this stupidity <laughs> later on. Like we'll laugh at the mouse, you know, that stupid thing where every you know, three million years of human evolution is translated to a click. <laughs> You have to remember that these pieces are almost as new to us as they are to you. The, the like fact that, the fact that we played them. 20 the, hours of music. She walked out and didn't even recognize this. Yeah, I was like, did we play that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <So laughs> I can't remember it. it was, there's this colossal amount of music that we've, that we've made it in the last. Some week. poor sucker will have to go through one day. <laughs> yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't 20 hours, by the way. Brian did another calculation. It, how many more? I think it's about 10. 10? I no. think so, yeah. What happens to self? Do you like switch on and off from being self conscious? Um, Br Brian really encouraged us at one point to only use one sound for, throughout the whole of a, of a piece. And I think it was something that really developed as we moved forward. And also self isn't something that I don't think we were going for really. Yeah. You know, was, this is not about self-expression. Yeah. It's about getting lost in music. And you know, I, I don't know who made a lot of these sounds. One of the interesting things about improvising music is that the listening part is as important as the playing part. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're playing uh, you know, a, a pre-scored piece of music, you don't really have to listen to it that much. I mean, it helps if you do, but you can still play the piece without particularly paying attention. I remember being on stage once in my early days in Roxy Music and singing and realizing I was thinking about my laundry. That was when I decided that I needed to leave the band, actually. But, but it was interesting to me that you could be, you could go through the motions of making the music and be somewhere else completely. Well, you can't really do that in improvisation like this. 
you have to actually be there and it has to be the world that you're mm -hmm. completely living in. And when, when you succeed in convincing yourself of that, it's, it's very interesting because you are lost and yourself is not in the picture at all. You're, you're just looking around at a place which incidentally you happen to be making at the same time. Um, and we're so skilled at splitting our minds, so, you know, you're having yeah. a conversation with somebody and you're nominally having that conversation and you're thinking like, I didn't realize that guy was bald, you know, why is, <laughs> why is she wearing that stupid party dress? And meanwhile, you're having a like, coherent conversation where, yes. you know, you're working on several different levels at once. But with this kind of music, you do have to sink into it and, and just surrender to it. Mm. So that I found really relaxing and really just... Yeah. It's, it is like a holiday, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't that amazing to get yeah. paid I, to go on holiday? <laughs> <laughs> paid leave. Actually, we weren't paid, were we? <laughs> no, we were not. <laughs> but <laughs> we had a good time anyway. <laughs> So that was an experiment in modern doo-wop. It, it's true. It was really. Yeah. But mm -hmm. That's doo-wop, but it's just taken into the 21st century. Not many people thought of doing that. Was that something you actually said before doing this, or is that no, an no, afterthought? That, that just emerged. <laughs> right. I just just realized. When I started doing that. <laughs> Um, and that, that sound comes from, um, there was a song in the late 50s called Duke of Earl. Duke, 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 Duke of Earl, Duke, Duke, Duke of Earl. And there's Earl. one part in it where a guy goes, Duke, Duke, yeah, Duke, yeah, 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 yeah. Like he keeps making that noise that I'm making there. Um, before my time. Yeah, that's before your time, Eve. Before your mother's time, probably. <laughs> Um, but I've been obsessed by that sound for, for most of my life, actually. It's like the most brutish male sound that you can make. It's the sound of man. Getting up, getting up, out of the mud. It, it involves having your fingers like that. It's a, it's a male thing. Women are just watching it. Yeah. yeah. We had a bit of wine. <laughs> <laughs> this is when you do it when you, you mm. don't really know what these things are for. They just sort of hang on the end of your arms. By the way, this reminds me that we should tell you what this shriek that you heard every 30 minutes before we came on stage was. Oh, yeah. That's Yoko Ono's, um, oh. of course. Uh, and she put that on YouTube, and you may be familiar with it, as a response to our, our new president. So that was just her one minute shriek. Well, you know, people often say, well, are you going to make political music then? But the thing I think, the important thing is that music is always political. You can't make that something without it being a political statement. And, for instance, the way we work together is a political position of some kind. It's a sort of anarchist, 
liberal anarchist political position. Um, the way an orchestra works together is a different political position. That's one that is a politics of hierarchy and of control flowing in one direction only. And it assumes castes and ranks and so on. You know, in an orchestra you have, apart from God, who is always there, of course, and the, the composer who's next in line, who's been listening to God, he tells the conductor what to do, and the conductor tells the sort of leader of the orchestra, and he tells the section principals who communicate to the section sub-principals down to the rank and file. Well, that's a, that's a vision of society, that is. And it's not a vision I particularly care for, but that, that is an, an idea about how a society is constructed. And it was the idea in, throughout the whole of the Renaissance about how a society should be constructed. So I think one of the most revolutionary things about pop music is that a lot of pop groups had people in them like me who couldn't do anything properly, who were incompetent, a along with people who were very competent, and somehow they did something together. So that's, that's a different prescription for social action, I think. Yeah, political in the sense that uh, how do rules relate to freedom? So yes. we construct some rules, but our goal is, I think, to be free. Yeah. And so sometimes rules allow you to, to do that. But, you know, the, the most self-conscious pol so-called politically um, uh, generative work to me is so repressive, I mean, I, and just boring, you know, and, and, and preachy. So I, I sometimes think, you know, uh, if I see a painting, it's like just a giant blue painting. Giant blue, that's it, that's all there is. I can feel more the feeling of freedom than I would with somebody's long, you know, uh, complicated narrative about the importance of freedom. Mm. So we're working with colors and sounds and it just, ah, that feeling. You know, yeah. not telling you how to be free, you know how to be free, you know. And, and it's, so it's not, it's, so it's, but we do also use rules. We've, we found rules were really handy. For we, us. we broke them quite a lot too. Yeah, and so it was, it was this, this kind of crazy balance, which always I, I think of F. Scott Fitzgerald, who, who is said um, something, his advice to young writers, which was, you know, try to hold two completely opposing ideas, one in each hand. They're both equally true and they're both absolutely the opposite and try to hold them both without going crazy. And that's how to be a good writer. Yeah. So I felt that that's what we were doing in the studio, or trying to this week, is finding the place between freedom and, and all of these rules to, to make something, but be able to hold both of those, and not just kind of go off in one direction, ignoring the, the world which is falling apart. My country is falling apart. Do I ignore that? I try not to. But if I get overwhelmed by it, I am completely overwhelmed. So I try to hold both of these things, mm. my ideas of what is beautiful and what is worth trying to make and do as an artist, as a person, and as a political person as well, and this other uh, entity which is, is uh, so holding the dark and the light things and trying to say, okay, how can I, how can I do this? You know? and n not pretend it's not there. Because mm -hmm. if you pretend it's not there, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, it's there. If you, if you pretend it's not there, you strengthen it, actually. Yeah. You, you make it more there. So this you this have, is the you danger have with America look at now. It, yeah. 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 You look at it and see it and, and, uh, and absorb it. But don't become it. It reminds me, uh, you know, of uh, the, the, the thing with holding two opposion, opposing ideas in one in each hand. It reminds me of your collaboration with Bowie on Sense of Doubt. Because you drew one card each of the Oblique Strategies cards. And, uh, well, maybe, I should, maybe you should tell the story, if you okay. like. Well, first of all, I have to tell people what the Oblique yes. Strategies cards are. Um, I shall try to do this quite briefly, because it can get boring, but um, this was a pack of cards, each card had a single suggestion on, and, and they were intended to help you when you're in a creative situation where 
you're stuck, you don't quite know what to do, or you're out of ideas, or you're lost. And the way they try to help you is by throwing you into a different frame of mind somehow. So on this particular, Bowie and I used to use them sometimes. We, we would each pull a card before we started working on a piece, but we would keep it secret so that we would both be working under a rule that the other person didn't know. And on, on that particular piece, it turned out that um, he had pulled the card that said, destroy everything. And I had um, pulled the card that said, um, destroy nothing and continue with immaculate consistency. That's two opposing ideas right there. That was, and it made for a very, very nice piece. Was it Sense of Doubt? Was that the piece? Yeah, yeah, from Heroes. Yeah. I didn't remember which one it was. But we, we were each sort of fighting against each other. But of course, as we were engaged in this fight, this lovely piece of music was emerging. So as with all of these things, as soon as the rules have done their job, you abandon them. R rules are sort of like a ladder for getting you somewhere. Mm. Once, once you've used the ladder, you don't need it any longer. But there's also such a thing as mind reading. And I um, also had an a, um, incident with um, David who called me up at night, around 1997 and he said, you know, and he was a friend, and uh, he said, I think you can read minds. And I said, I can't read minds. He said, I think you can. I said, no, I can't read minds. He said, we're gonna do this experiment. What you're going to do is you're, sit, you're going to sit by your fax machine with a piece of paper and a pen. And I'm going to call you up and put the phone down and then we each make a drawing for mm -hmm. one minute and simultaneously fax it to each other. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we tried that. In so we did this. And, okay, the first two pages that came through uh, my drawing and his drawing what are the chances that in these both drawings, there's a house, and out of the and, a, and a, a bush in the corner, and out of the second story of the house is a post, and hanging from the post is a man. Both drawings. The chances are zero mm. that two people would draw the same thing. We did it ten more times, and each time, the drawings have the same things in them. So I'm just suggesting that mind reading is a possibility. Mm. It was the first time I thought, maybe this could really be true. Maybe the two of you, when you were working, uh, maybe this is something David was tuned into. What do you mm. think? I mean, it's kind of if, odd. Yes, if it happened, it happened from his side, I would yeah, say. Yeah. Because I'm very skeptical about things. Exactly. Like that, yeah. Mind know. reading. <laughs> yeah. But we, we were tuned in in a funny way, uh, which was literally a funny way, which was that we just used to joke all the time. I, I think in the whole time we knew each other, we only had two or three serious conversations. The rest of the time we were just... Joking. Joking, yeah. It was hilarious. And, and it was a very... He, he was so funny. He's, yeah. he's the wittiest person. Yes. Um, and we just would constantly... We went into these two characters often. There, there was a famous um, English comedy series um, that involved um, Pete and Dud, the characters were. And they were two, two working class English people who talked like this. Hello, Pete. <laughs> Hello, um, mate. What do you think then? So, <laughs> so we're working on these pieces of music that subsequently became uh, sort of anthems, like heroes. and. And actually, in the studio that we're sitting, perhaps I shouldn't tell you this. Cause <laughs> <laughs> By all means. David won't mind. <laughs> Who is sitting there saying, oh, what do you think then, Dad? <laughs> there too much guitar there, is there? <laughs> uh, do a rowick. <laughs> these fucking guitar players, they're all over the fucking shop, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and that was most of the time we were talking to each other like that. But I, I thought afterwards that that was a way it was a sort of charade because when you're in character like that, you can say whatever you need yeah. to say. You know, it's the court jester. The court jester could say anything because he's the guy making the joke. But in fact, what he says is often the true things that nobody else dares say. 
So it's sort of like a masquerade or a, or a carnival or something like that, where you take on this other character in order to say the things that you really want to say. And when they're delivered in that tone of voice, they, they can't cause offence. Do you see what I mean? Puppetry. Absolutely. You're defended yeah. against them. A journalist once showed up with a, and she said, do you mind if we do this, um, uh, if I ask you the questions using this sock puppet? <laughs> and I said, that's a good idea. And they said, well, uh, do you mind if I answer with yes. a sock puppet as well? Because I have a lot of like stray socks, you know, uh, they just have lost their partners and I have extras. So do you mind if I just talk like that? And it was one of the greatest conversations I ever had for the same reason. Because you don't have to like really be yourself. <laughs> Pete. That's, uh, Pete. <laughs> whatever your name is. That's a good strategy. We should have used yeah. that. <laughs> I think we did. We did in our own ways. Actually, you know? in... Because we use kind of crazy voices sometimes. In that doo-wop song. Yeah. That, that's, that's true. Just, that's true. Yeah. We were... Talking another... We were both in character there. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I was the male. <laughs> and you were the little microphone. <laughs> Should we listen to some more music and sure. uh, wave God, goodbye? Maybe one uh, more thing? I don't know if anyone can take it. Can <laughs> there's one called Monday and there's one called Friday. Which is the shorter one? The shorter one is Monday. Let's play Monday. Okay. Okay, so any final thoughts on this piece? Well, Before, we can, oh, not, I don't since even, none of us I can remember, remember what, what it is. No, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> it was our first day, so it cut us a little slack. Um, <laughs> you know? Yes, I have lots of thoughts about this piece. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Look, go ahead. Can we, can we hear them? No, I can't remember them. Okay. I haven't got it so far. Oh, the, it's down. The volume is down. Ah, the volume is down. Oh, Jesus, what an idiot. <laughs> okay, sorry. I can't now remember which one. Yeah, one of those, isn't it? Okay, okay, let's start again. Oh, yeah. You got it? <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> Lori? I, that's the foot pedal. I, yeah, yeah, we could play this one. Okay. That's the foot pedal. Yeah. You know, you know that, foot, that foot pedal. Okay. Do we have to sit here? Shall we sit here? It's pretty short. You could just turn... Why don't you turn the lights out? Your eyelids are becoming very heavy. Heavy. <laughs> heavy, sleepy.
Thank Lars for doing yes, it. Yes, Lars. Lars, thank you, Lars. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Lars. Where is Lars? Where is it? Come on, Lars. Lars, come on come up here. here, dude. Come here, Lars. Come here, Lars. This is Lars. <laughs> this was his idea. <laughs> Yay, Lars. Take a bow, Lars. <laughs> thank you so much. Good thank night. you, Brian Eno. Ebo, Laurie Anderson.